Hello, and welcome to this video. Some people have asked if I would address a recent study published of ivermectin for prophylaxis of COVID-19 done in the city of Itajai in southern Brazil. In fact, I've read the paper now and looked through it in, in some detail, and I'm going to do two videos on it. This is the first of those two. And in this video, I'm going to be addressing just the process of publication, not the science. So the conflicts of interest, the publication process. This is a very curious story, and I think it deserves a video on its own. I'll come back to it with a follow-up video about the science. So let's get started. So first, let's address the background for this. How did it happen that this study was published and how did it happen that this study got raised as something that people wanted me to cover in one of my videos? Well, the background is this. This study, ivermectin prophylaxis used for COVID-19, it was a citywide observational study. They call it perspective, but as I'll show in the next video, that's a bit of a misnomer using propensity score matching in the city of, of Itajai in southern Brazil. When this study was published, there was a lot of interest in it. Um, some of our familiar characters uh, put out information or put out videos and articles about it uh, that were very dramatically worded about the reduction in mortality claimed by the authors. Uh, this wound up on places like American Greatness and a variety of uh, newspapers. It also got picked up, of course, by the FLCCC, which basically is, is built on promoting ivermectin for COVID-19. It was also followed up by a number of fact-checking organizations. So PolitiFact put out something about it saying, you know, it's, it's flawed based on their, uh, the experts that they consulted. Uh, another site called Health Feedback, which is basically scientists who work with them and put out these, uh, uh, their evaluations, they also claimed that it was flawed. They were working with the preprint, but the preprint and the final paper are very similar. So what to make of this? So in the rest of this video, I'm not going to address the science at all. I'll leave that for the video that follows. But in this, I want to address some of the issues in the process. And the first of those is the conflicts of interest. So this paper was accompanied by pretty impressive undisclosed conflicts of interest. In this case, I actually had a bit of a role in, in uh, uncovering these or in, in getting them to the attention of the journal. Um, and uh, so I'll discuss uh, the whole process as well which is part of what's been occupying my time besides my regular day job. So how did that work out? So if we look at this publication, the study title looks ordinary enough, but if we look at the authors, we can recognize some names. For example, you might recognize Dr. Pierre Corey from the list of authors as the founder and head of the FLCCC. Now, typically when you submit a paper for publication in a scientific journal, you have to declare your conflicts of interest. These may be financial conflicts of interest, or they may be other conflicts of interest, non-financial, recent past relationships, prospective future relationships, and so on. Anything that may have influenced the work towards the conclusions that were reached, or influenced the work at all. In this case, all of the authors this is from the paper. All of the authors declared that they had no conflicts of interest of any sort. They didn't get any, any payments. They had no financial relationships at present or within the previous three years with any organizations that might have an interest in the submitted work. And they have declared that there are no other relationships or activities that could appear to have influenced this submitted work. Now, is that really true? Well, one of the authors is, of course, Pierre Corey. This is from his LinkedIn page. He is the founder, the uh, CEO, chairman of the board of directors, and uh, co-chief medical officer of 
the frontline COVID uh, critical care alliance, the FLCCC, which has developed a series of protocols that involve ivermectin that they claim have a benefit for COVID patients. This is clearly a conflict of interest. It, in some sense, it doesn't matter if he's directly paid by them. He can uh, get speaker fees and various other fees. He also runs a business. He runs a telehealth business where he charges um, roughly $1,000 for a telephone consultation, he, $250 if the consultation is with a nurse and not with him. And he offers right on the front page of his website, he offers that they offer off-label medicines, including ivermectin. In addition, the FLCC itself, FLCCC itself, promotes the use of ivermectin in COVID-19 very actively. It's produced documentaries about it and so on. And in fact, he's not alone because Dr. Flavio uh, Cadigiani, who is the corresponding author of the Curitol paper, he's one of the founding FLCCC physicians. So he's one of the people who's credited with developing the ivermectin protocols for COVID-19. And he is the corresponding author of the paper in Curious about this ivermectin prophylaxis for COVID-19. And he and Pierre Corey are listed in the author contributions with having made a, a lot of contributions to the analysis. In addition, Dr. Cadigiani has uh, had some infamy in Brazil. This is an article from the British Medical Journal late last year, um, discussing a trial that he did also in COVID-19, but on another agent, on uh, an agent called uh, proxalutamide. Uh, it's endocrine kind of therapy, and he is an endocrinologist by training. And I, I don't know anything about Brazilian politics, um, but I presume this is a fairly charged thing. In this case, he has been the, in, within the parliamentary inquiry in Brazil, um, he was identified as having committed, quote, and I'm not making this up, crimes against humanity. So that's not at this point germane to this paper, um, but that's, uh, that's the corresponding author of this paper. Now, in addition, the paper is authored by Juan Chimia. Um, who appears on a number of, uh, is very well associated, strongly associated with FLCCC communications. Um, Juan Chimia is a data analyst and lists the FLCCC as his employer on his LinkedIn page. And uh, so very clearly he has a conflict because the FLCCC is known more than anything else for promoting ivermectin for treatment and prophylaxis of COVID-19. But it's not just limited to the FLCCC. Uh, one of the other authors is uh, Dr. Jennifer Hibbard, who is a dentist and dental surgeon in Canada. Now, she's been very active in Canada. She is one of the founders of the Canadian COVID Care Alliance, which is kind of a sister organization to the FLCCC in Canada. They are very pro-ivermectin. They're also, to some extent, anti-vaccine. They put out quite a bit of anti-vaccine um, uh, promotions and, and so on. So they've been very resistant to vaccines. And she is also a founder of what I think of as basically an umbrella organization for these anti-vax pro-ivermectin groups. And that is an organization called the World Council for Health. So she co-founded the World Council for Health and she is listed as on the steering committee of the World Council for Health. The first national member of the World Council for Health is the Canadian COVID Care Alliance, which she also co-founded. And in addition, the first author, Dr. Lucy Kerr, who's most known in Brazil for having uh, warned about dangers of mammograms for many years, so she is, uh, her specialty is, is ultrasound. 
Um, she founded a group called Medicos Pela Vida, which means Doctors for Life in Portuguese. And this is a Brazilian anti-vax group, pro-ivermectin COVID group, and is another member of the World Council for Health. So many of the authors, basically, she had, or they had a bunch of their videos removed for violating YouTube's terms of surface for um, various reasons. So now they work on Rumble and Odyssey. Um, but uh, she's the first author of this paper, and she's, you know, clearly tied up in um, these in these uh, these issues. So I think it's fair to say that a lot of the authors have some form of conflict of interest, and it's true even if they're not directly paid by these organizations. Now, as I was reading through this, I realized these these issues, and I also realized that while they were discussed on the comment section of the article at Curious, uh, they had not been addressed in the paper itself. And so on March 17th, I wrote to the editors of Curious and let them know of the undisclosed con uh, conflicts of interest. I just described them briefly, the ones that I was aware of. The co-editor-in-chief responded that day and said that an investigation would be opened. On March 20th, the editor-in-chief, John Adler, Dr. John Adler, wrote me and asked for more information, which I sent what I had. On March 21st, I was notified by email that a correction in the journal would be uh, forthcoming. And on March 24th, 25th, so I saw it on the morning of the 25th, but it's the future here in Singapore, so it may have been the 24th for many people, and it was listed as the 24th on the Curious website. The editor-in-chief, Dr. John Adler, emailed me with the details of how it was resolved, and Curious published a correction, including issues that I hadn't even raised. So they, they had identified additional issues. So what was that correction? It appeared here. You can see it corrected, 3-24-2022. And the correction included, it has come to the attention of the journal that several authors failed to disclose all relevant conflicts of interest as World Curious is issuing the following erratum and updating the relevant conflict of interest disclosures to ensure these conflicts of interest are properly described as recommended uh, by the, I think it's International Committee of Medical Journals, something like that, I am ICMJ. It turns out that Dr. Kerr has been a paid consultant for an ivermectin manufacturer and, well, paid consultant for Medicos Pea Vida, which she co-founded, which promotes ivermectin. Uh, Dr. Caragiani also consulted for ivermectin. He's a founding member of FLCC. And then uh, the rest are the things that I, that I mentioned earlier. So this all is an important set of corrections for this paper. It's a necessary set of corrections for this paper. When I wrote to the journal about this, I pointed out that, of course, people who have conflicts of interest, researchers who have conflicts of interest, are free to do research on areas in which they have a conflict. They're just required to disclose it. And in this case, not disclosing it gave the appearance of no conflict of interest when that is clearly not the case. And that is just not ethically permissible. Ethically, they are required to list their conflicts. That's a basic process, a basic requirement of the process of journal publishing. Now, the next thing I would like to discuss is the peer review. The paper uh, is listed as being peer reviewed. Uh, when Dr. John Campbell discussed it in his video, he mentioned that it had been peer-reviewed. It's important not to reify peer review, but it's important not to abuse the peer review process either. The Curious Journal, in which this paper was published, has what I would consider the most unusual peer review process I've ever seen. It's not uncommon for authors to uh, recommend a few possible peer reviewers, people who are experts in their field who would be credible for peer reviewing it. Usually, they would not invite their collaborators 
or recent collaborators, certainly their current or recent collaborators. In the case of Curious, every paper is required to have five, an amazing number, five author invited peer reviews. And uh, they're supposed to be expert reviewers and, um, uh, and, and that's it, basically. And in order to proceed, two completed reviews are required. Now, note they say one of which may, must be from a reviewer invited by Curious. So if you, if you provide five peer reviewers for invitation, Curious may ask for a sixth. But notice that this requirement is waived within 21, if, you're, if two author invited reviews have been submitted within 21 days. And this creates an, a massive loophole, especially considering the rapidity of the curious peer review process. Uh, this means that if you invite a couple of people and they put in a positive review within 21 days, your paper, at least on the scientific merits, is going to be accepted. Now, 21 days is very fast for a journal. Very, very fast. And Curious prides itself on being rapid reviews. Dr. John Adler, the editor-in-chief and I believe the founder of the journal, has publicly put it on the record that he believes that peer review should work much, much faster and that most of it is procrast most of the delay is procrastination. Now, certainly procrastination plays a role. I've procrastinated in my peer reviews, for sure, and uh, that definitely plays a role. But I disagree that peer review can be done in a matter of just an hour or even a few hours in many papers because the papers can be complicated. Science is hard. At any rate, this is a massive loophole. If a paper gets through within 21 days, I would think that in those cases, there haven't been any uh, curious invited reviews. Um, it, it, it just seems unlikely that there have been really very serious reviews. Now, I don't know, but this is very unusual. Okay. Uh, in this case, if we look at the paper itself, the review began on the 4th of January and the review ended on the 13th of January and it was published on the 15th of January. Uh, that's incredibly fast, just incredibly fast. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it sort of boggles the, uh, the imagination, um, it, or it beggars the imagination for a paper of a large uh, cohort study to be uh, reviewed and, and accepted in nine days. That's just very, very unusual. And uh, uh, just, it strains credibility. What it suggests is that the, either the, the authors invited reviewers who reviewed it very quickly and, or the editors invited reviewers who reviewed it very quickly. I, I mean, it, it takes a while to read a paper like this. And so it's not trivial for somebody to make the free time to be able to read it and review it and offer credible feedback. So those are the author invited reviewers. Now notice the author invited reviewers, again, they have to invite a minimum of five individuals. But there's this other thing here. Notice the curious invited reviewers here. In addition to author invited reviewers, curious editorial staff will handpick selected members of the curious editorial board and or allied specialists. So it's actually unusual. Another unusual part is for the journal to pick its own editorial board members to review papers. Usually the, the editorial board looks outside uh, in order to basically spread the work around because it's all volunteer work. And it says here, two completed reviews are required to satisfy peer reviews. And one of those reviews must be from a curious invited reviewer, but we see here another loophole. Articles with a curious laureate author are exempt from the curious invited review requirement. Now that begs the question, what, what is this? That's what I thought when I first saw it. What is a curious laureate author and how does it exempt them from the curious invited review requirement? So this means that any curious laureate author can basically invite their own reviewers for their own papers. 
So what is that? Well, it's a reward system. Now, I, I've never seen anything like this in any other journal, and it's something that uh, is key to how Curious works. So effectively, this is a reward system. It's kind of like frequent flyer miles. If And they, they run from Scholar, Magna, Summa, and Laureate. And effectively, if you assign SIQ scores, which is kind of a, a, a scholarly uh, impact or influence quality, submit author invited peer reviews, submit curious invited peer reviews, and or publish as a first, last, or submitting author, uh, publish as a middle author is slightly less, complete your profile, receive article down. You know, basically, there are all these methods for um, gaining points. And you gain points in this, and then the points ultimately give you this curious scholar, curious magna, curious summa, and curious laureate. Let's look more at the curious laureate because it does say what these rewards are. So if you get those points, again, this is a little bit like a, a reward system for shopping, you get priority customer support, you get a higher weighted quality score, which is amazing, uh, a discount on the editing process because they charge for editing, higher search ranking results. And then here in Laureate, you see exempt from, you can see exempt from uh, curious invited re review requirement. That's what that check is. And below that, the other one that's checked here is lifetime award never expires. So for the curious laureates, uh, they not only get to skip the curious invited review requirement and invite their own reviewers, but they get to do it forever. It's a lifetime uh, reward. And I've never seen anything like this, not even remotely like this. It's, it's just hard to fathom. But you can look at any author on the Curious website. And it turns out that every single author in this paper, even if they've only published one, even if this is the only thing they've ever done, and for all of them except for one, it is. They've published this one paper, and they are all now Curious laureates. So they can all submit forever to curious without ever needing a reviewer that they didn't invite themselves. Now that is, again, a bit hard to understand. Now, I never would have looked at this. Honestly, never would have looked. I was interested in the curious laureate, curious laureate thing because that's just so unusual. And so I think it's just a, a, a window for abuse of the peer review process you could drive a truck through. But I only came across it because I happened to look at Dr. Lucy Kerr's website. And on her website, she talks about having received this Curious Laureate Award. Um, so she received it on January 16th and uh, for their extraordinary contributions to the Curious Journal of Medical Science. This part here is in Portuguese. I had a friend help me translate it. Um, a Portuguese friend helped me translate it. And this particular line jumps out, Vassinas Assassinas. And Dr. Kerr has helpfully um, also put in some stuff in English on there. And we can note that it, it, we have this, your, your many contributions, if earned you curia, curious laureate status. Again, this one contribution, she was the first author on this paper. And then I think this part, even though it's still in quotes, is her own language. I am very happy to receive this recognition because of the work of Itajai, although it is really a lot of work, allowed us to have the knowledge about the work, about the actions of ivermectin and prophylactic use. Everyone else kills these groups more, especially the killer vaccines. Uh, so that's something, um, I guess her commitment to uh, anti-vax is, is pretty well out there. Um, and that is in fact what the uh, the Portuguese vaccines, assassinas, whatever that was, that means killer vaccines. So there we are. So what are the key points of this very strange and, well, curious process? One is there's no e evidence of really independent critical peer review. 
Um, I think the peer review process is just too short for that to be credible. Um, it's just, un it's very unusual for a paper of this size and complexity to uh, be go through peer review process with no request for revisions so quickly. Very unusual. But it's a very unusual process that they have at this particular journal, like nothing I've ever seen. Secondly, the timeline for receipt to acceptance in nine days is just far too short. Just really way too short for ordinary peer review, much less revision. So I think referring to this paper as peer reviewed and saying, well, that gives it a, a stand of credibility. Uh, it's not like other peer reviews. Uh, it, it's really not. Um, and I, I don't think the Curious Journal says peer review, not peer rejection. So they're very supportive of getting papers out there, um, not being overly critical. They want positive feedback. Uh, there are lots of loopholes, um, lots of mechanisms for non-independent or non-credible peer review in addition to just the timeline itself. Now, it's true that some papers, right, if there was, a say, a, a case report, technical note, that kind of thing might go through very quickly. But I think it's very unusual for a research paper, a real research paper, especially, you know, a complicated one to go through this, this quickly. And every single author has been rewarded with this lifetime curate laureate, curious laureate status, which is just baffling. I, I just don't even know where to start to think about how that happens. Is it that Dr. Kadigiani kind of promoted them for that because he already had some contributions and maybe he was a laureate before? Just hard to say, but it's just very, very strange. So I'd like to make a few closing remarks after this bizarre little incident. Uh, Dr. Cattagiani has reacted with both gratitude and apparent indignation that Curious put up this revised disclosure of conflicts of interest. He says he's grateful that the journal did the right thing. Um, and he's also irritated because he says that there were no conflicts of interest and that the um, uh, that the it was just some sort of sandbagging of their effort. Um, in response, he put out a document on ResearchGate, which he claims is even an even more full disclosure of conflicts of interest. But it is very strange. It basically looks like the curriculum vita of vita of every author, and I don't know what he expects people to get out of that, but. There it is. It's especially strange for them not to claim any conflict of interest when a recurrent tactic of the FLCCC, whenever a randomized clinical trial comes out that shows no benefit for ivermectin, they accuse the authors of having some sort of conflict. And this has happened repeatedly and over and over again, even when the accusations of conflicts are just so far removed as to be laughable. Even more, when I realized that Dr. Katagiani was the only one of these curious laureate authors to have actually made a contribution to Curious prior to the, uh, the Itajai paper, I went and had a look at some of his previous papers, and his most recent paper is a paper published just in December, which is a paper on proxalutamide. Now, I believe this is the same study or a very closely related study to the study that was the topic of the British Medical Journal news article about um, these various accusations of uh, terrible breaches of clinical trial ethics in Brazil and an accusation of uh, crimes against humanity against Dr. Katajani in particular. Nonetheless, this has apparently now been published. I don't know that it's exactly the same, but I think it's the same. It's certainly studying the same agent for COVID, proxalutamide. In this case, the time for review was even faster. It was seven days, so a single week. And in this paper, so I read the paper and in the paper is the most amazing passage. 
And the, Dr. Catagiani is both the first author and the corresponding author for this paper. There's a section on this paper about, which is titled Scientific Aspects of Studies on COVID-19, and it's basically the authors, Dr. Cottagiani et al., uh, complaining about various aspects of doing research on COVID-19. And in this rant, toward the end, they have this passage which I've highlighted here. Due to the unclear interests that have increasingly influenced the scientific methodology in publication, we encourage all scientific community to be fully transparent by declaring all direct and indirect conflicts of interest, not only restricted to the current conflicts, but also extended to the previous conflicts and potential future conflicts that could influence at any extent the results and analysis for both positive and negative responses, as well as decisions and evaluations when acting as reviewers or editors. We also claim that conflicts and competing interests to be more emphasized and visible within the manuscripts and publications. Now, leading us, leaving aside the sentence wording in that, um, this is a remarkable passage for somebody who, had, who then followed that up with another paper in which the other paper is basically claiming no conflicts of interest when the conflicts of interest are evident. To everyone. It's just impossible, I think, to miss the irony of that statement, to have such a, a moralizing view of conflicts of interest and then ignore one's own conflicts of interest at the same time. At any rate, if you've enjoyed this content, feel free to give it a like. You can subscribe if you want to see more like it. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see other content or what you'd like to see if you have questions that weren't answered here. And in the meantime, stay safe.